Hello and welcome to another episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. Let's meet the panel. I'm Cindy. Hi, I'm Renny. And I'm Josh. And today we are going to be going over a Percy Shelley poem. It's called To a Skylark. I found my uh, copy of the poem in this collection, uh, edited by Dover Thrift Editions or Dover Publications, English Romantic Poetry. I remember going over Romanticism in British Literature too, and they even, in, at Kane Ocean, they did teach a class on Romanticism. Uh, I did not take the class, but I know people that did. Rennie, do you have a discussion starter for To a Skylark? Yes, he begins with, uh, Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, how can a bird never be? I was doing some research on the origins of this poem, and Percy Shelley was inspired by a walk that he took with his wife, Mary Shelley, who we know from Frankenstein. Right, Frankenstein. It was in a uh, town. It was in a town in Italy. And he came across this beautiful bird that he felt was too good to be true. Ended up writing about it in what I felt was a very. To me, the poem is very Wolfian because it doesn't necessarily examine the skylark per se, but more so his outlook on wanting to connect with nature. The sound. More so the sound and the idea that why it can never be is uh, what he. What he sees is uh, he's trying to figure out how something can be so beautiful and within his own world. And not see. It is so yes. high, he can't see the bird either. He can only hear the bird. And he does do, I don't have, the different stanzas of how the songs are and mm. of how the music is that he runs through it. Mm -hmm. And yes, he is uh, fascinated by the fact that it is part of nature. And he was big on strolls. And I loved Shelley. I was just saying to Josh earlier that the romantics seem to be fading from the anthologies. Byron hasn't been in an anthology since I was teaching college and since 2005. Shelley used to have Ode to the West Wind and it would have in the back extra poems Ozymandias. I also love Ozymandias because of the so-called history involved. I met a traveler from an antique land and I just like this because uh, he's trying to describe something in words that only he can hear and you, yourself, cannot hear what he's describing. So it's like seeing a ghost in a way. It's something that is there, but everybody can't perceive what that is. And he is really terrific with language in bringing out something that seems to be magical. Possibly one of the reasons he's not quite as popular since the second wave of feminism in the 60s and 70s is when they came out that he didn't write Frankenstein, because Frankenstein was originally published anonymously, and everybody assumed it was Shelley, who couldn't get anything published because he was thrown out of college for writing a, an essay on the necessity of atheism. And at the time, there was no necessity of atheism. And he was uh, disowned by his father. Exactly how they lived, I don't know. They moved from place to place. They couldn't pay bills. They just stiffed everybody. I, I can't imagine how they lived and worked. But he didn't necessarily write this poem this way. He wrote whatever it was he felt he wrote. And then years later, his wife, after his death and her return to England, she put everything together. I, how much that was done, say, with this poem or anything else, I cannot really say. But I think there became an anti-Shelley development in criticism because maybe the poems were not exactly all his own, that maybe Mary constructed a great deal more than we actually realize. He is a fascinating character. Once said he never went a day without laudanum, which is like opium dissolved in alcohol. You could buy it over the counter like aspirin until 1910. I don't even know where he got that either. Oh, he must have been stoned most of the time. He could have been, definitely. They drank a tremendous amount. Most of the end of his life, he was in Italy. He and Mary were together five years. They had four children, only one of whom survived. She was always pregnant or nursing the whole time they were together. So I'm not so sure if you'd stand back and look, it looks quite so romantic. They have fascinating lives. And I think his poetry is just ephemeral. It is that way. It's like something, it's like a dream. You can't necessarily exactly touch what he's saying, 
but he's incredible in putting these words together to bring about whatever it is that he wants you to hear or wants you to see. Even as good as Wordsworth or Coleridge or anybody else's of the, of the Romantics, I don't think any of them can do anything the way Shelley could create. I mean, Shelley's is very scholarly and requires a lot of also, concentration. Yes, now. Yes. I mean, I think that Wordsworth and Blake and Coleridge, I think Coleridge is more accessible in the way that his is more, it tells a clearer story. Wordsworth is a bit more, I think, oh, words, oh. yeah, I think that you can get more engaged in the details. Blake's is a bit simpler, whereas... Blake is a little bit earlier at the two than yeah. the real romantic. I would say Shelley, even Keats, and even Byron are more language-driven. Yes, yes. Well, Byron was very, also very still narrative-driven, a lot of his mm. poems. He was disinherited also and was thrown out of England because he had an affair with his half-sister. He supported himself. He was a star and supported himself on his poetry. I think he's the first modern person to do so. And he wrote long poems um, that came out in um, pieces, like serials. And people waited in line to get whatever the next part of the poem was coming yeah. out. With yeah, him. I could see that from Byron. Yes, because that, yes. that's in here too. Uh, yeah. Did you uh, anything stick out to you, Cindy? I I was I saw the um, the very flowery language. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very very elegant and very pretty. You know, you get kind of get lost in mm. all that purple prose. Yeah, yeah, you're kind of prose. you're kind of yeah. It's like a little bit you entwined get a little lost. into it. Yeah. Like okay, where are we now? Well, there's something <laughs> about this this bird. And it's just really elegant, and yet unlike some of the others, it's it's hard to like really make a connection because because it is so purple. So full of mel melodious, really. Mm -hmm. Yes, imagery. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that this was more of a poem of Percy Shelley's ode to and his thinking about what the sound of the skylark mm. brought to him rather than the concrete. No, it's not concrete. Part of it. Yes. Yeah, it's not, you don't really, it's not about the skylark or a description. Not even so much of the way it sounded, more so what the se how Shelley responded to the sound. And I think that there can be people uh, more so like entry level, people that are like just your general English 2 students, uh, in some cases English 1 students, that will probably be looking for more of a concrete meaning. They're not necessarily going to get right. that. That's true. And he was, even though he got thrown out of Cambridge, he obviously had a very strong Latin and Greek uh, tutoring as he grew up because he is also full of tremendous allusions and references all the time. They're not necessarily in this poem, but they are in many of his works. Was there anything else that we were looking to explore within this poem? or No, uh, I would say to people that since we're not seeing, I think, as many of the romantics as we did at one time, well, 50 years ago when I was in school, that um, we need to look at them ourselves. I think that it's worth examining what's not being examined. I've always made the best possible effort to look into everything that literature has to offer, even in certain aspects. Uh, I would much rather prefer to get a complete collection than a selected collection. Like, if I were to get a Percy Shelley collection, I'd want the complete rather than the selected, because that allows me to make a decision as to what I feel is his standout work. Because there's often those hidden gems that, that go forgotten. They produced a tremendous amount of work. He and, and Keats died both very young, and you can get a book of Keats that's like this. Yeah, Ke I, I've absolutely. seen a Keats anthology. I think Penguin incredible. Classics is incredible. Yes. a chunker. And the same, at least Keats was being published in his time, and so was Byron. He, he never lost being published, but in his life, Shelley was almost not published at all. He was banned. He was disliked, and he was uh, cast out. And I think that make, makes him a romantic attraction in some ways. He did produce marvelous material. I, I do want to explore more of it. I was just thinking on the subject of romanticism, do you think it might be dying out? Because people are writing in that style? Partly, and because we're so much into the modern confessional style. Romanticism is more of a period than it is yes. a genre. Most of your poetry is free verse, and it's often somebody's an outlet for somebody to express their inner feelings, uh, more so than anything else. Right, they're not writing about anything, it's only what they feel. 
pretty much the case, and that's what you see being published. And because free verse is so easy, it's basically we can write any. It, it's kind of like dancing, where <laughs> a freestyle dancing allows you to make any kind of movement you want, whereas more of a structured dance like a waltz or a quick step or a tango or a pasodoble require more technique. You can create within the technique in order to make it stand out. It also takes learning and studying. Yes. It does require a certain form of skill, but when somebody's able to accomplish it and then make it their own, that's uh, an, it's, it's a success on itself. The rhyme scheme is very much... Uh, because people will often fall back on just traditional rhyme, and even that is a challenge because you sometimes uh, concede to certain details that really don't necessarily allow the poem to flow, but you're just settling for it because of the rhyme. When it comes to uh, lyrics, they're constantly riddled with cliches. Alrighty then. Anybody uh, have anything else to add as far as... Well, if we're going to give numbers, I would give the romantics in general like a four and a half to four and three quarters. Most of their work is really interesting, worth pursuing. I generally don't rate singular works. Uh, I would have to read throughout this collection before I give it a rating. I mean, oftentimes I will give very well put together collections a perfect score on the basis that I feel that they very well represent what it is that they're trying to get at. Like my Edgar Allan Poe collection of <laughs> stories when it's a complete, or stories, poems, because I think he's a magnificent writer and it's a great thing to have his work all in one place. And the same thing with my complete Shakespeare collection. It does have that train wreck of a play in Titus Andronicus, but yet it has everything he's, what we can say, legitimately written. We're excellent. Yes. If you're interested in checking out Percy Shelley, uh, this poem, his other poems, and the poems of Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, and Keats, uh, here is Dover Thrift Edition's English Romantic Poetry. Thank you for tuning into this video. I hope you check out some more videos from our channel, and for now, keep reading. Thank you.